European Union had put in place, passed laws to at least give them the power to stop these vaccines leaving the EU if the European Union and countries within the Union were going to be left short. But the EU ambassador, I spoke to him this morning, he's the EU ambassador to Australia, I asked him whether the group of nations was attempting to hoard vaccine supplies. No, we are not. Um, we have um, adopted a transparency and authorization mechanism that is exactly that. We want to have transparency about uh, shipment uh, from the EU to other countries and we will authorize them. Uh, it is not an export ban and I, I would want to say this again, it is not an export ban, it's not an export restriction. And I'm very pleased to announce that um, the first shipment of vaccines um, will arrive here in Australia uh, on time. Um, and I'm very excited about this because the Pfizer-BioNTech mm. uh, vaccine has been developed by BioNTech Company. It's a, it's a company in Mainz, a small university town, very close to my home place. So the first vaccinations that will be used here in Australia will come from the European Union. OK, do you have a date in which they will arrive? Well, that is uh, for uh, the Australian government and okay. the producing company to arrange. Um, what we will do is we will ensure that there will be a smooth authorization process. OK, but what does this authorization process mean? Because if you're not hoarding vaccines, why did the European Parliament vote to give yourself the power to halt vaccines if you need to? Why do you need that power if you're not using that as a threat? Well, we had faced a situation whereby we felt it was a kind of a wait a minute um, a situation whereby two companies told us at very short notice that they would not be able to deliver um, vaccines um, that we had already uh, prepaid and that we were expecting for a rollout. One company, Pfizer-BioNTech, informed us that they were upgrading their uh, manufacturing sites um, that was a very transparent process and um, in, as a result of that we will receive 75 million more doses in the second quarter of this year and they will substantially ramp up production in Europe. Um, the, AstraZeneca yeah. um, you, you informed us that You have been accused of, of trying to hoard vaccines, though. This not only goes against the multilateral reputation of the EU, but also goes against World Health Organization advice. Do you accept that? No, we don't. Um, and for the simple reason that um, all uh, vaccination exports to uh, developing countries were automatically exempted. So we are working, um, in fact, with Australia to ensure that COVAX, um, the, uh, the setup, the framework uh, to help uh, developing countries will continue. Mm. And we've provided 850 million euros to finance that. Um, and uh, we are organising a second um, specific health summit in Italy around the G20 summit okay. this year uh, to uh, support COVAX activities. Well, Ambassador, it sounds like this original move by the parliament, at least to give the EU those particular powers, has caused a bit of a diplomatic incident, to say the very least, and quickly the EU is backpedalling. Well, um, I'm not sure that, that this is the case. Um, first, it hasn't really produced a diplomatic incident. Um, we have worked calmly with our Australian partners. Um, we have assured them that the uh, delivery will be on time. Uh, Minister Hunt was in contact um, uh, with counterparts. Um, so that, that wasn't the case. And, and we said right from the outset, and, and, and that's what the minister said himself, mm. this is a, a measure that is not targeted against Australia. We, we had to set up guardrails in our operations with, our, uh, with companies uh, that produce in Europe, and that's exactly what we did. It's um, one of these measures that uh, you have to put in place in order, hopefully, not to use them. We did this in a proportionate manner and temporarily because this, this regulation will end okay. at the end of March. I mean, is, does the EU have a, a broader concern here? You look at the rollout of vaccines in the United Kingdom. That is a living, breathing example of the benefits of, of Brexit, isn't it? Not being part of the EU bloc. It seems the UK has been able to be way more agile in the rollout. Well, this is a very hypothetical question. The answer to that is actually 
it wouldn't have made a difference because um, even member states could approve vaccinations uh, at national level, and some have done so. Mm. So you don't, you, if, if um, you don't uh, want to work with the European um, uh, medicines agencies, approval for the entirety of the EU, you could have done it at national level. And the same is true for the for the rollout activities or for the negotiations with pharmaceutical companies. Mm. So, um, but let me let me be very clear. We are, of course, in Europe, um, also pleased that uh, our neighbouring countries have a rollout and they're very, very successful in doing that, um, because we have to fight this um, um, pandemic together. Yeah. And we are very concerned uh, about variants um, that are spreading. So. I think uh, we have an interest that everyone uh, is doing its bit. The EU ambassador to Australia, they're not about to concede that the UK has benefited from Brexit when it comes, out, comes down to the vaccine rollout, but the UK is well ahead of the EU, you'd have to say.